business owners. Brainwave Solutions Australia Proprietary Limited. Brainwave Solutions started in November 2009 with a vision to help Australian small businesses and provide innovative enterprise solutions. Their services include website development, mobile apps, IT consultancy and financial services, contract management and payroll services. NNS Bowman Proprietary Limited. Trading is Mortgage Choice Card, Australia's most reputable and favourite finance brokers. They work on a franchise model and provide services like residential and commercial mortgages, financial planning, car and personal loans, life insurance, general insurance and loan protection. People Energy Proprietary Limited. People Energy is an Australian electricity retail business, currently retailing electricity to small to medium businesses and residential customers. Their single purpose is to give Victorian customers a retailer that understands what they need. Resume Solutions. Resume Solutions, founded in 2008, offers personal branding, career coaching, resume and LinkedIn profile development, job search and interview training to newly arrived migrants, graduates and mid-career professionals. Their services are offered across Australia. Congratulations to all those nominees and apologies once again. I'd like to welcome Rohini Kapadat from Picture Partners back to the stage to introduce our keynote speaker. Well, what an inspiring night this is. Honourable John Howard, distinguished guests. On behalf of Picture Partners, let me say just how delighted we are to be the platinum sponsors of the Indian Executive Awards for the second consecutive year. And thank you, Indian Executive Club, for bringing together this wonderful awards platform that recognizes the achievements of so many in our fast growing Indian business community. Our partnership since the inception of the awards has been a productive one and held together by our common goal of seeing Australian Indian businesses grow and reach their true potential. Picture Partners has advised entrepreneurs and generational family-owned businesses for over two decades, and we see many parallels between our traditional clients and clients from the Indian business diaspora. Relationships with our clients and our partners lie at the center of Picture Partners. And today we see that relationship with the Indian business community taking yet another strong step forward. We have a team of about 550 people who love the firm in Melbourne alone and across Australia we have about 850 people and we recently opened an office in Dandenong to get close to the businesses in the southeast and we hope that we will see some of you in our offices either in Sydney, in the, in the city or in Dandenong. And now, I have the special honor and the privilege of introducing a man who needs no introduction, and certainly not here in Australia. <coughs> he is Australia's 25th Prime Minister and the second longest serving Prime Minister after Robert Menzies. The youngest in a family of four boys, John Howard was raised by parents who, like most Indian families, were vigilant about the education of their children. It appears his path was set for him when his father gave him the middle name Winston after the legendary British Prime Minister, Sir Winston Churchill. He's the only Liberal Prime, uh, Party Prime Minister to be educated in a state school, which I think would have contributed to his hallmark characteristic of tenacity and defiance of the odds. In the course of 11 years as Prime Minister, John Howard led a government with a wide reform agenda, key amongst which were the sale of Telstra, a restructuring of industrial relations, and the introduction of the GST. Australian society owes a particular debt to John Howard for imposing strict gun controls which have led to creating a safer society in Australia. John Howard had an instinctive understanding of India's importance in the region and refocused Australia's efforts with India. He visited twice during his tenure 
taking bold steps to inject a renewed sense of purpose into the strategic relationship. So ladies and gentlemen, it is a special honor to present to you an avid lover of cricket who has played at county level, a great leader of our nation, and you will see a most eloquent speaker, our former Prime Minister, John Howard. Anybody who saw me attempt to bowl on the mountains of Kashmir would know how extraordinary it is to be attributed with county level proficiency. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to be here tonight for a number of reasons. First and foremost, um, I want to say uh, thank you uh, to the Indian diaspora in Australia for the remarkable contribution that you have made, you continue to make, and you'll go on making years into the future to the growth and development and stability and the harmony uh, of Australia. Recently, McKinsey and Company produced a report for the United Nations projecting forward the population of the world and the composition of that population. And it predicted a number of very interesting things. And two of those things stood out. The first was that by the year 2030, and that's only a little over 16 years from now, there will be 2.2 billion additional middle-class consumers in the world and 1.7 billion of those 2.2 billion additional middle-class consumers will live in Asia. And I'll come back to that in a moment. The other projection, and it's also very relevant to what I want to say tonight and very uh, relevant to India, and that is by the year 2050, which is a little further on from now than 2030, by then for the first time in mankind's history, for the first time ever, the total number of people in the world over the age of 65 will exceed the total number under the age of 14. Now those of you who study the demography of the world and study the demography of India and of Australia will understand the enormous significance and the enormous potential of both of those statistics for our two countries. For India remains a very young society. I was recently amazed to be told that the age cohort in India between 15 and 25 was the largest age cohort of any country in that area, 15 to 25, the largest in the world. And that the total number just exceeded the total population of Indonesia. So India will have an advantage because of the relative youth of her population, not only now but in the future, compared with many other countries, not only in Europe, where the birth rate has fallen very significantly, but also in Asia, particularly compared with the huge nation of China. And what both of those things, those realities represent to Australia and India is an enormous opportunity for the future. Australia and India have a lot in common. We have a common language, essentially, we have some common history. We have a common love of the greatest game in the world. <laughs> and uh, we, broadly speaking, have 
a common legal system. I first went to India in 1964. I travelled through Asia. I went to um, the then Malaya, and then to India, and then to Israel, and then on to Europe. And I remember as somebody who just uh, become a practicing lawyer, attending a sitting of the Supreme Court of India in New Delhi. And uh, I heard briefly a case between the central government of India and one of the states of India. And I heard in the course of the submissions from the various lawyers reference being made to a decision of the High Court of Australia in the 1920s. And it brought home to me on my first ever visit to that country just how much we had in common. We had a common legal system and we were both federations. And of course, being a federation presents special challenges not only to the central government but also to the state government. So we do have many things in common. But over the years, we haven't always had as much to do with each other as we should have. And when I uh, went to India as Prime Minister in 2006, and I had a lengthy discussion with my counterpart, Dr Singh. We talked about this. We talked about how it was that over the years we hadn't had as much to do with each other as we should have. But we are changing that. And the relevance of a gathering like tonight, bringing together so many people from the Indian diaspora, largely but not totally here in Melbourne. You are all playing a major part in building on those fundamental strengths of the relationship and making sure that in the years to come, we have a lot more to do with each other than we have in the past. India has an enormous contribution to make to the future not only of Asia, but also of the world. But it's a contribution that I want to see her make in partnership with her friends in Australia. And those of you of the Indian diaspora who have come uh, to this country to make your homes here, to become Australians, and to become so much part of our community, you are owed an enormous debt of gratitude by other Australians. One of the greatest things that Australia has done since the end of World War II all those years ago is to welcome millions of people from around the world. And we ask only one thing of those people and that is they become part of the mainstream of the Australian community. And you've demonstrated by what you've done You've demonstrated by what we've been told tonight of the way in which you are making a contribution as part of the mainstream of our nation. Nobody asks you to do other than retain a special place in your heart for the country in which you were born. And that is always understood by Australians whether they were born here or born elsewhere. You have brought great enrichment to our country. And one that I'm particularly impressed by tonight is, of course, your commitment to small and medium enterprise. As you know, from the time that I was Prime Minister, uh, I believe in private enterprise. I believe in the work ethic. I believe that one of the greatest things any man or woman can do is to start a business with absolutely nothing and build it into a thriving enterprise and leave it for their children to carry on. I was brought up in a small business environment. My father owned a small petrol service station in the inner suburb of Sydney. I know what it's like to run a small business. You don't have any guaranteed market shares. You don't get paid penalty rates if you work at weekend. You don't get paid any overtime. You've got no guaranteed customers. You just got to rely on your own ingenuity. And that is, of course, has been the stories that have been told tonight of so many people who've started businesses right across the free enterprise spectrum. And I've been inspired by the stories I've heard tonight and the contributions in so many areas of business. Both Australia and India, in order to succeed in the years to come, 
must retain their economic competitiveness. When I was Prime Minister, I frequently said that economic reform for a nation is rather like competing in a never-ending foot race. The finishing line keeps receding. You want to give up because you know you're never going to reach that finishing line, but you can't give up because if you do, other competitors will surge past you. And that is the challenge in different ways and on a different scale in each case that are faced by both India and Australia in the future. All nations go through phases of economic reform and economic change. Sometimes they grow a little weary of it and then they realise, because of the hot breath of competition, that they have to pick up the reform challenge again. That has happened to India. She went through a period of great economic reform in the early 90s. There are some signs that in recent years that has slowed down. I think the same thing on a different scale has happened in Australia. We had some great economic reforms and they produced great results. Over the past few years, I think we've fallen off the pace so far as economic reform is concerned. We live in a world of globalisation. It's here to stay, we're never turning back the clock because globalisation has done a wonderful thing. It's lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. When the story of the last 50 years the world economy is written decades into the future. The principal item won't be the global financial crisis starting in 2008. The principal story will be the extraordinary way in which, through globalisation and the forces of competitive capitalism, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. And it's a wonderful story to be properly told. Now, in nations such as India, there is still an extraordinary amount of poverty. And there are still great challenges, not only for the Indian government, but also for the rest of the world. But you won't take those people out of poverty unless you continue to have a strong economic and business environment. The best poverty reduction program in the world is a growing economy. All the development assistance aid coming from wealthier countries, that is all well and good and it makes a contribution. But nothing makes a greater contribution than expanding trade opportunities, creation of new businesses, particularly small businesses, because they are the businesses that employ people by their hundreds, their thousands and their millions. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, as I've listened to the awards and the stories of these successful companies, I've been reminded, as I'm sure all of you have, of the tremendous importance of free enterprise to the fabric of our community and the fabric of our society. Ethical free enterprise. Free enterprise that not only seeks to make a legitimate profit, but also seeks to give something back to the community and has a sense of social responsibility. And that is something that has been driven through all of the awards uh, that have been made tonight and all of the contributions that have been recognised tonight. Our two nations are so vastly different. Our demography is different. Our backgrounds culturally and in many respects religiously as well are different. But we have many great things in common. We have a common commitment to freedom. India is the largest democracy in the world. And it's a democratic miracle that in the years that have gone by since India won her independence in 1948, that she has remained faithful to the democratic ideal. And when I think of the history of, of the world over that period of time, India and Australia are two of the small number of countries that have remained continuously and faithfully democratic. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, can I say again how Great it is to be here in Melbourne, to be part of this gathering. I want to again thank the people of the vast Indian diaspora, estimated variously between a half a million and a million, but whatever the precise number is, that doesn't matter. What really matters 
is the goodwill of your fellow Australians towards you, the contribution that you have made to our country, but most importantly of all because this is a night as much about the future as it is about the present and the past, the contribution that I know you and your children and grandchildren will continue to make uh, to the further growth and the happiness and stability of our nation. Thank you for that. I wish all of you good morning and good health. Thank you.